Welcome to our Facebook Live discussion. I'm Stephanie Stapleton, an editor here at KHN. And I'm Liz Zabo, a reporter at KHN. And today, we are talking about vitamin supplements and whether science really backs up their promise in terms of keeping people healthy. If you have questions or comments, please post them on our Facebook page. Now, Liz, in April, you wrote a story about vitamins and about how widely used they are. Can you tell me what led you to that story? Sure. Well, as a health reporter over the years, I've written so many stories about vitamins. And some of the stories were about early results showing that vitamins were really promising. But there are an awful lot of studies and an awful lot of stories about vitamins just crashing and burning. They looked really good for a long time, and then it all came crashing down. And it made me think, why don't vitamins work? Or at least, why don't vitamin supplements work as well as we expect them to, at least in most people? Okay. And this story, as I understand, is part of a broader series that you've been working on, Treatment Overkill. Can you tell us a little bit about that series? Sure. It's a, a series called Treatment Overkill, and we're looking at an idea called overtreatment, which may seem like a weird concept to a lot of people, but it's the idea that sometimes less is more. Some of our studies have looked at things like cancer screening at the end of life when it's really not going to help people or really high rates of surgery even at the end of life. When it comes to vitamins though, it seems like we're over-treating ourselves. We're taking things that are not really proven to help us and in some cases may hurt us. And if you're interested in reading more about her series or reading the story that Liz wrote and that we're gonna talk about today, we put links to both of them in the discussion section of our Facebook page, so you should check it out. Now, back to the vitamins. And we've already said how widely used vitamins are. I think 50% of Americans take vitamins regularly. And for older Americans, that number goes up even higher to 67 or 68%. That's right. So that makes me think this is big money, lots of money spent, lots of money in the industry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, it, I feel like just about everyone I know has taken a vitamin at some point, even if only half of us are taking them now. As a kid, I think I took Flintstones vitamins, mm-hmm. and it's a huge industry. There are 90,000 different dietary supplements, and that can range from anything from a multivitamin to vitamin D or iron to herbal supplements. Um, and it's also a really big industry, $30 uh, billion dollars a year. That's billion with a B. $30 billion a year in sales. So a lot of times people make a differentiation differentiation between the drug industry as a, a big industry and the vitamin industry as if it's all mom and pop stores. The vitamin industry is a big business. Okay. Then also as a big business, how is it regulated by the government? Well, vitamins are regulated by the FDA, but not the way that people think. Um, They're regulated more like a food and not so much like a drug. If you have a cancer drug that you want to put on the market, you need to do clinical trials to prove that it works. It has to be proven safe and effective. Um, But vitamins are regarded sort of like food because people think about, well, we get vitamins from food. So just the way you wouldn't need a clinical study before you sell spinach, if you want to sell an herbal supplement, you don't really need to prove Um, that uh, your spinach extract or whatever your extract is, is actually going to cure a disease. You're still responsible for the safety. So just like the way spinach could be recalled if it has a bacteria on it, if there's a major adulteration in um, your supplements that are making people sick, the FDA is still going to hold you responsible. So they are regulated, but not nearly as strictly as drugs are regulated. There are rules, though, about the claims that manufacturers can make regarding the benefits that they can have. That's right. When I've bought vitamin, when I've bought vitamins, I've often noticed that it may say something like promotes digestive health or promotes bone health. And the FDA allows vitamin makers to say that. What they can't say is cures osteoporosis or prevents diabetes. The FDA is going to send them a warning level, a warning letter, if they try to make those kinds of claims. Okay. And if you're just tuning in, I'm Stephanie Stapleton, and this is Liz Zabo, and we are talking about vitamins. If you have a comment or question, please post it to our Facebook page. Now, back to the issue at hand. Um, 
Where did you get the idea to look into vitamins, vitamins in this way? Well, you know, it really came from an editor of mine. She said, well, I've been told that I'm low in, in vitamin D. And I said, you know, the data on vitamin D is not really shaping up to be what we thought. It's the typical pattern where early studies suggest that vitamin D is associated with lots of good things. These are early preliminary studies. But as the really rigorous studies, the gold, what we call the gold standard of medical evidence, as those studies have come in, once again, vitamin D, which had looked really great, is losing some of its luster. The randomized control trials, those are the gold standard studies, have not really shown that vitamin D is preventing heart disease or diabetes or a lot of the things that people are really worried about. Okay. And there's some kind of, I know we've talked before, there's also this idea that there's some history that made us think that vitamins had this great power. Yeah, right? well, it's an idea that's really been around for over 200 years. If you think about sailors out in the 1700s during the age of exploration, they suffered from these awful diseases like scurvy because they were vitamin deficient. They would quickly run out of fresh fruits and vegetables on their ships. They'd be eating stale, ratty biscuits, and they would get these horrible diseases that could actually kill you. Um, scurvy could actually be the deciding factor in who would win or lose a war because so many sailors just died from scurvy. People figured out, though, that fresh fruits and vegetables and the vitamins and fresh fruit could prevent scurvy. So that's when st sailors started to pack things like oranges and lemons and limes on the ship, and that's how they were able to finally prevent scurvy. Flash forward to the 20th century, people actually started to put vitamins into supplements. And this was really the first time that we got vitamins as a pill. And people thought, gosh, if vitamins can prevent these specific diseases related to vitamin deficiency, and not just scurvy, but things like beriberi or rickets. Rickets was a disease with, when kids would get these warped bones in their legs from vitamin D deficiency. And if a little vitamin can prevent a deficiency, maybe a little bit more vitamin can prevent other diseases. Maybe more is better. And Americans always tend to have an attitude that just like money, just like hugs and sunshine, <laughs> more must be better. And so people started to take more and more vitamins. Okay. So it seems like part of the reason why this idea of, of these vitamins found traction was plain and simple good marketing good messaging, but also I'm wondering what role did modern medicine have in furthering this idea too? Yeah, well, there has definitely been some major marketing and marketing mm -hmm. I wasn't even aware of before I read books like Vitamania, which is a really good read. They talked about how people actually invented the word vitamin in the 20th century. They combined sort of vital, vital eff essence and uh, minerals, and they got this word vitamin which makes it sound like something that's really, really good for you. Mm -hmm. But doctors have contributed to this as well. Doctors are not immune to fads, I've been told, and they can get on the same nutritional fads that mm -hmm. the rest of us get on. So a while ago it was beta carotene, and then it was vitamin, D, vitamin E. Now it's vitamin D. Lots of doctors are testing their patients for vitamin D. So it can be a little confusing when you get conflicting advice from doctors every few years, mm -hmm. and doctors sometimes even tell you to go ahead and get tested for mm -hmm. a vitamin. I know. I know my doctor always says, like, have you taken your, mul your, your multivitamin? Are you doing that? Do you keep up with that? I don't. But um, aside from that, there are particular populations and people that can benefit from taking vitamins, Correct. Yeah, ab absolutely. Although there's no general recommendation that everyone needs to take a vitamin routinely, there are particular times of life and there are particular medical conditions that can be helped with vitamins. For example, when women are pregnant or even thinking about getting pregnant, they're told to take a prenatal vitamin. And prenatal vitamins will have things like iron to prevent anemia during pregnancy. They also now have folic acid, which is a really important B vitamin. And it's important for the baby in just the first few days and weeks of pregnancy. So even women thinking about getting pregnant are told you got to take your B vitamin. So there are particular times of life, particular medical conditions. Some people have diseases like Crohn's disease where the, their guts just don't absorb vitamins and nutrients the way they should. So 
people with those particular diseases may also need a vitamin, but really no one says that we all need to take a multivitamin. Okay. Now, I want to step back to some things you said a little bit ago when you were talking about the studies that we've had about vitamins and, and their their preventive benefits, so to speak. And you talked about preliminary research versus the more rigorous studies. And can you talk us through those different levels of investigation, sure. I guess it is? Sure. Well, when researchers are researching things like whether it's a drug or a vitamin, they tend to start with the easier types of studies that can be done more quickly. Not that they're easy. I know I couldn't do them. I'm not a researcher. <laughs> but, um, for example, they might say, hmm, let's see, what do people eat in Japan? There's a much lower rate of heart disease in Japan. So what are they eating there? So you might get some general conclusions. And you might say, hmm, well, people there eat a lot of fish. Is fish good for you? What is fish made out of? And then people start to look at fish oil, and they'll look at it in the lab, or they might look at it in mice. Um, they might look at long-running studies where thousands of people have been asked to go about their normal lives, eat what they eat, but write down what they eat. And they look at their food diaries and vitamin diaries. And with things like fish oil and vitamin D and even hormone replacement therapy, the people who were taking those things all looked like they were much, much healthier. And then doctor said, well, I think we've got enough evidence now. We need to test this in a definitive way. Let's spend the money. Let's get tens of thousands of people, or at least thousands of people. Let's spend five years, maybe more, looking at the question. We'll randomly assign you to take a vitamin and you to take a placebo. And after a certain amount of time, we'll see who has more cancer, who has more heart disease, who's more likely to die. And that's really the only definitive type of study. That's the only thing that can prove cause and effect. But they take time. Mm -hmm. So often a preliminary study will look really good, and the marketing on a vitamin like maybe beta carotene or vitamin E or vitamin D will go nuts, and everybody is taking it because it looks really great. But when the definitive evidence comes in, suddenly things aren't so great. And it turns out that things that we thought uh, we're causing you to be healthy. We're just sort of going along for the ride. That that people who take women's, uh, for example, in the women's health study, the Women's Health Initiative, found that women who took hormone replacement therapy actually were more likely to have really big problems like cancer, heart disease, and stroke. It looked good for a long time because the women who just naturally took and chose to take hormone replacement therapy were also doing other healthy things like not smoking, exercising, dieting. So it's easy on those kinds of early studies to confuse cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot with vitamins. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I think that sort of can gets people to want to take vitamins is this idea that the American diet is so terrible that they need to. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, in some ways, they're right. The American diet is awful. We eat too much sodium, too much sugar, too much fat, too much, just too much in general. We have too many calories. We're overnourished. But the one thing that we're not is um, vitamin deficient. And that's something that I learned doing this story is that basically all of us are taking vitamins, whether we realize it or not, because we're eating food, because our food is really, really heavily fortified. I think 100 years ago, there were a lot more diseases related to vitamin deficiency. There were little kids who worked in factories, never played in the sun, and they got crooked legs from mm -hmm. rickets. Um, so a long time ago, the American government decided, well, let's fortify our food. Let's put vitamin D in milk, right? We all drink vitamin D fortified milk. If you're a baker like I am and you buy a sack of flour, you'll see that it says enriched flour. Well, that's enriched with B vitamins. Even your salt, if you buy a normal a container of salt, will say iodized salt. So we're actually, all of us, every day, taking in an enormous number of vitamins just by eating food. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting about it is even that if you have a really terrible diet and you roll into a burger joint, your chocolate shake is going to be fortified with vitamin D the white bread bun on top of your hamburger is going to have B vitamins. Even the salt that is poured onto your french fries is going to have iodide. So doctors tell me that even though our diet is 
really horrible in many, many ways. It's not low on vitamins. Okay. Now, sort of the flip side of this brings me to a question that we have from one of our viewers, and it's from Tracy. She wants to know whether having a plant-based diet means you need to take supplements, plant-based obviously being kind of vegetarian and what we would all think is the opposite of rolling into the burger diet. Yeah. Well, I'm not a doctor. I've written a lot of stories, but I don't qualify as an MD. So I would ask your, I would ask your MD. Um, I know some people who are. There's some concern that someone who is vegetarian or vegan may not be getting enough iron in their diet. But that's really a question for your doctor to mm-hmm. to tell your doctor what you're eating, and they can tell you if you do need something like iron or or any other kind of supplement. In general, though, plant based diets. Awesome. (laughs) Plant-based diets uh, are highly recommended by everyone. Um, They're linked to lower risk of heart disease and lower risk of cancer. So good for you, Tracy. (laughs) Now, sort of on just stepping back for a second on this issue, are there good good online sources or resources where people can look to kind of find out? Like, where would you look to find out about how vitamin – B or vitamin D is standing up in the latest studies. What are some of the good spots to check that out? Yeah, well, I tend to go for the nice establishment uh, websites. I would mm-hmm. tend to go to the National Institute of Health. Okay. Um, that's a that's a good, reliable site. If you're worried about uh, cancer and want to know if there's a cancer prevention diet, I would I would look at the National Cancer Institute. I would look at the American Cancer Society. The American Cancer Society has done a lot of nutritional research, and they have terrific dietitians, registered dietitians on staff that I've interviewed. So those are two of the ones that that I'd go to. I'd stay away from um, you know vitamins. R us or, or that's probably a real website. <laughs> I just, sorry, uh, I, I'd stay away from anything that looks like a fly by night source and go for the establishment sources. Okay, good. Now back. This is sort of also related to all of our terrible diets, but this idea that, well, just in case, isn't it better to be safe than sorry? And sort of take take this and take that and make sure I'm getting everything that I need for good health. Won't I be better off in the long run? Will I? The researchers that I've talked to um, say that really Americans are not deficient and you don't really need to worry about that. But the idea of be, be, saying, well, I better be safe than sorry can actually get you in trouble because it is possible to overdose on vitamins. Now, if you take a standard multivitamin every day, you're probably not going to overdose. I think the overdose issue can come in when you're taking more than one supplement and you're picking and choosing. Um, our our research for this story um, turned up the fact that I think 29% of people 60 and over take four or more supplements. That's really getting into a lot of supplements. So they always say that when you go to the doctor and they say, what medications are you taking? Tell them that you're taking vitamins because in some cases, vitamins might interact with your medicine. They might either negate the medicine that you're taking to treat your disease or your condition, or they might ramp it up and amplify it so much that you get an overdose. But it seems like the safest advice that people have given to me is to just treat a vitamin the way you would a drug. If you think it has a real biological effect, if you think it has a real biological benefit, then it has the potential, at least the potential, to have a side effect. Mm -hmm. So you should... um, you know, be concerned. And I think I mentioned vitamin E and beta carotene, that um, those vitamins everybody thought were going to be great. They actually increased the risk of cancer. Um, There was a big interest in beta carotene 20, 30 years ago. And people thought because of lab results that it could prevent cancer. So researchers said, hey, let's give this to people at really high risk of lung cancer, heavy smokers, asbestos workers, and let's see if maybe we can save some lives. When this final study was done, the people who took beta carotene had more cancer. So doctors quickly did a 180 on that one and stopped recommending beta carotene. Vitamin E was the same way. Every cardiologist was giving their patients vitamin E Mm -hmm. because it looked like it could prevent heart disease. It looked like it could prevent cancer. There was a big study um, that looked at uh, whether vitamin E could prevent prostate cancer when the results came in, once again, the men who took vitamin E actually had more prostate cancer. Another analysis found that people who took vitamin E 
were more likely to die for any reason. It increased what they call all-cause mortality. So even though vitamins might seem really benign, um, and certainly a, a standard multivitamin doesn't seem to have any risk, um, vitamin D is really popular, and the experts tell me if you're taking a, a regular 1,000 international unit of vitamin D, that doesn't seem to have any risk. You just really want to be careful about mega doses and ask your doctor. Don't ask me. Ask your doctor. Okay, and I want to. I know we all have already spoken about the preliminary studies versus these more rigorous sto- studies, and you just mentioned how, like, when more final data came in, what are there some studies sort of in the pipeline right now that that you think will have results that really draw a clear line on some of these questions? Yes, absolutely. Um, in the last few years, there's been a, a steady trickle of randomized controlled trials. That's the gold standard of evidence um, that have been chipping away at the alleged benefits of vitamin D. There's a big trial with, I think, 27,000 people called the SELECT trial of uh, vitamin D. No, sorry, the VITAL trial. It's called the VITAL trial of vitamin D, and that uh, should be coming out in November. And that'll give us a really good idea if vitamin D is all it's cracked up to be or if it's a waste of your money. There's also a trial called COSMOS that's looking at, of all things, um, cocoa, uh, (laughs) cocoa supplements and also multivitamins. And that will also tell us um, if those multivitamins are as good as we all hope they are. Okay. And now we have another question from a viewer. Matthew asks, Liz, what is your opinion on the AREDS supplement formula for preventing age-related macular degeneration. Um, It seems to have shown legitimate evidence for use. Well, again, I would say to ask your doctor about that, but that was also a really specific example. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is an awful disease. It's a leading cause of blindness. So it would be great if something as simple as a vitamin could help to prevent that. But my understanding of the ARID study is that they looked at people who already had early macular degeneration, and they gave them certain vitamin supplements that seemed to slow the deterioration and to keep them from progressing to sort of full-blown or really bad macular degeneration. My recollection is that this wasn't about, say, healthy people um, and to prevent completely healthy people. Um, from developing macular degeneration. I think these people already had it, Mm -hmm. and it slowed the deterioration. I don't think we can say with any certainty that a totally healthy person can take vitamins and then be guaranteed that they'll never get macular degeneration. That's my recollection, but I wish I'd read up on it a little bit more. (laughs) That was a good question. (laughs) So ask ask the question, if you want any specific medical advice, please ask your doctor, not me. So... um, One of the things that is in your story that I thought was really interesting, um, it was the the demographics of vitamin takers. I know it seems to be women take more vitamins than men. Higher earners take more vitamins, probably because of their disposable income. Can you talk about some of those demographic trends and what they might mean? Yeah, it's really interesting that the people who tend to take vitamins are probably the people who need them the least. They tend to be healthier and wealthier than other people. So they tend to be non-smokers. They tend to be well-educated. They're educated enough to read and be reading about vitamins. They're wealthy enough to have access to medical care and access to vitamins. Um, They tend to be a little bit older. Um, But it's interesting to me that I will sometimes hear from someone who is 80 years old, and they say, well, I take vitamins every day, and I never get a cold, and I am really, really healthy. And that's great. I'm glad they're doing so well. But what those types of callers don't also mention is that they're non-smokers. And if you never get a cold, it probably has to do with the fact that you don't smoke because it's well known that smokers are more likely to have lung problems and lung disease and bronchitis. Um, I know other people who say, well, I take vitamins every day and I think they're really important to me and they look great. And if you saw uh, one of my friends on the street, you'd think, wow, she's a great... Um, spokesperson for vitamins. She looks terrific. She's a healthy weight. But I think what keeps her so healthy and at a healthy weight is the fact that she jogs every day. 
Um, she loves beets and vegetables. <laughs> she gets up early in the morning and packs her own lunch and packs a healthy salad. Mm-hmm. So she does everything you're supposed to do. And sometimes a lot of people like that will say, hey, I'm healthy because I take vitamins. Mm, maybe not. You're probably healthy because you exercise and don't mm-hmm. smoke. So that's one of the major reasons why these early studies can be so confusing because the people who take vitamin D or the people who take multivitamins look great. They're much healthier than the rest of us, but it's because there's something about someone who has a healthy behavior that makes them healthy. And we really don't have any definitive evidence yet that it's the vitamins that are making them healthy. Okay. Now, um, we've covered a lot of ground so far. I'm just interested in how the, the vitamin industry itself has you know, how they process all of this information. How, what kind of messages do they put out to the public? How has their messaging changed over time as, I guess, the information has changed or maybe not so much? I don't, can you help us with that? Well, um, not surprisingly, the vitamin industry is still really pro-vitamin. Um, <laughs> so they really still want you to take vitamins. Um, and when I was interviewing someone from the vitamin industry, they, they pointed to a couple of studies that offer some support for taking vitamins. So in, in all fairness, there was a study called the uh, Physician's Health Study. Um, these were male doctors who were taking multivitamins. And there was a small signal there that the multivitamins might have helped. The doctors who were taking multivitamins had an 8%, I think it was 8% lower risk of cancer. So for any one individual, lowering your risk of cancer by 8% is really not going to affect you. On a population level, if we could lower cancer rates in the United States by 8%, that would be enormous. We'd save a ton of lives. So why isn't that convincing, and why isn't everyone told to take a multivitamin? It's because the study was not very diverse. Um, Everyone in the study was a man, so we have no idea. There was another study, I think, in in Europe as well that also had some promising results, but also only in men. So we need to include women. Mm -hmm. And the new studies that are being done now, like Cosmos and Vital, are including women. So we need to include women. Also, doctors are really different than the rest of us. Again, they are healthier and wealthier. Um, They're better educated. They have more money. And those things alone tend to correlate with better health. In every data set I've ever seen, people who are better educated and wealthy, on average, tend to live longer and live healthier. So there's some signal that maybe the multivitamins might have a benefit, but that study had so many serious limitations that no one's making health recommendations on it yet. And there have been a lot of other studies that found no benefit to multivitamins. Okay. Now, if you're just joining us, we're getting close to the end of our talk here. But if you have any questions or comments, it's still not too late. You can post it to our Facebook page. Um, I'm Stephanie Stapleton. This is Liz Zabo. And... um, just, I want to plug your story again on the vitamins, and it is on our website, and you can also find the link in the discussion section of our Facebook page. But Liz, tell me, like, when you started reporting this story, was there anything that really surprised you about what you found out? Anything unexpected? Yeah, the biggest surprise for me was just finding out that we're all vitamin takers, and mm-hmm. we may not know it. The mm-hmm. fact that our diets are so heavily fortified. And when I was a kid, I remember I used to sit there and read the back of the box of the Fruity Pebbles Mm -hmm. and look at all the different vitamins. You started this early. (laughs) I started this early. (laughs) I was always a reader. Uh And uh, when you look at you, you, look, even Fruity Pebbles, it goes back to the idea that we have horrible diets with too much sugar. But even Fruity Pebbles, and not to bash Fruity Pebbles, Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch and Frosted Flakes, they're all fortified with vitamins. And they all have... um, you know, they, they all have thiamine and niacin, and basically we're all vitamin takers, whether we realize it or not. Okay. Then just the last, my last question for you is, what do you, like, if you, a friend of yours or a member of your family asks about a specific vitamin or what do you think about vitamins, what do you tell them? Um, well, again, I would say ask your doctor and not me. But in general, I haven't seen any data showing that a regular multivitamin, I won't mention brands, but the the general sort of standard multivitamin causes harm. It Mm -hmm. seems like those seem to be safe. 
there's a huge debate raging about vitamin D. Do we have a pandemic of vitamin D deficiency or are we massively marketing vitamin D unnecessarily? Mm -hmm. But in general, the, the, best the best researchers tell me that your standard vitamin D supplement that you'd get at the drugstore, um, which is 1,000 international units, there doesn't seem to be any harm to that. So if people want to take it, most doctors tell me they'll tell their patients, fine, take it. The one thing I would be concerned about if a good friend were taking supplements is if they were taking supplements um, for diet, the weight loss supplements, the, um, the weight lifting supplements <laughs> uh, to grow muscle mass and to get bigger, and the sexual potency supplements. <laughs> Those three categories um, make up the vast majority of complaints. And when you see problems coming up in dietary or nutritional supplements, it tends to be one of those three. So if any of my friends were taking those, I would really urge them to be a little cautious and, again, to ask their doctor about it. Those, those seem to be the riskiest. Okay, and we do have a question from a viewer. Peggy is wondering whether anything works for bone health. What do you know about that? Peggy, that's an awesome question. And for years, I was uh, taking vitamin, um, vitamin D and calcium because um, we have a lot of tiny osteoporotic women in my mm -hmm. family, and I thought I, I better start building my bones right now. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the um, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which is a big expert group that uh, provides nutritional and prevention advice to Americans, they've just come out with guidelines that say for the general population, uh, don't take vitamin D to try to prevent um, weak bones and bone fractures, which is really interesting because they came out a few years ago saying that we should not be screening people for vitamin D deficiency, that it really wasn't helping to just get a vitamin D test at every doctor's appointment. Now they came out and uh, they actually said, don't take vitamin D. So that was sort of a surprise. Um, the one thing I do hear from people is that exercise seems to help if you really want to help your bones that lifting weights in moderation and again consult your physician mm -hmm. but um, a, a reasonable amount of resistance exercise can build your bones but um, you'd have to talk to your doctor and and it's a little disappointing because I think a lot of us would really like an easy inexpensive pill that we could pop every day to make us healthier and we don't like it when we hear the news that we actually have to go to the gym. <laughs> we have to work at it. <laughs> okay, and I think that does it for our Facebook Live today. Thank you, Liz, so much for talking with us. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon.